This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Hello, everybody. Hi, Robin, if I may. This is really a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, I'm actually very excited for this talk. I'm super interested in the topic. So I'll just begin with a very brief introduction and then I'll, of course, uh, leave you the stage. So Professor LeBlanc uh, specializes in the archeology span of numismatics, coinage uh, of the Roman provinces. Her current research explores Roman civic symbols, local myths, and foundation imagery in the coinage of provincial cities. She's also developing projects on uh, mythological female founders in the Roman Empire and on Roman piggy banks. And she has participated in several excavations in Israel, England, and Montenegro. And uh, she's the co-director co of Women in the Roman East, which is definitely a very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, uh, project, which we want to hear more. I want to hear more. So, and uh, now I'll leave, of course, the floor to you, Robin, and thank you. Um, so thank you so much. I was, I was really delighted to be invited and to uh, share this research project that has been uh, going on for about four or five, five years now, slight interruption from COVID. Um, and what you're gonna see today is basically um, an outgrowth of a larger series of questions that I applied to um, provincial coinage largely in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, that basically considers the way that uh, the local bronze coins that cities are minting um, and what they sort of say about a city's uh, civic identity. So local identities, but also uh, colonial identities. So what I'm gonna do is give you a um, brief introduction to um, some of the, the characteristics of uh, coins of colonies. And then the rest of the talk is going to be a sort of deep dive into one particular motif that shows up again and again and again um, on coins of Roman colonies. And it's, it's the one you see uh, in front of you here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how this motif uh, sort of manifests in a colonial context, um, but importantly, how it gets adopted and then adapted uh, by various cities to sort of negotiate a colonial identity, particular to the circumstances of that community. So in other words, each colony is not a colony in the same way as the others. They have their own traditions, priorities, histories, um, their own entanglements uh, with the Roman state. And we're gonna look at some examples uh, of that today. Uh, so just to give us a sense of what we mean by the Roman colonies I'm talking about, uh, the earliest Roman colonies date to like the fourth century BCE. Those are coming from central Italy. Uh, the colonies that I'm talking about um, are part of a process of colonialization that really gets started in the first century BCE. Um, these colonies are uh, taking place in the provinces, so in the western provinces, but increasingly in the eastern provinces. And most of these colonies are being settled by uh, discharged soldiers who were promised land and uh, Roman citizenship um, after uh, their, term of their, their military career uh, ended. And in this period, that land is increasingly in the empire, um, in the provinces rather than in Italy. So these are largely veteran settlements, veteran colonies. Um, some of these are new, brand new settlements, um, and others involve settling a group of veterans in an already established uh, city. So that's the case, for example, uh, for Beirut, which is the coin you see here, um, a very large and prosperous long lived city before a group of Roman veterans um, are settled there and the city gains colonial status in uh, 14 uh, CE. So this major wave of colonialization begins under Julius Caesar and Octavians in the context of civil wars, um, and it will sort of uh, continue in fits and starts over the next uh, three or four hundred years. Um, some areas will have more colonies than others, but just to give you a sense of um, how big this initial wave of uh, provincial uh, colonies um, is, there's about 169, give or take. Uh, colonies that Julius Caesar and Augustus found um, in the Eastern Mediterranean, Western Mediterranean. And Suetonius tells us that Julius Caesar himself is responsible for settling something like 80,000 uh, colonists in the provinces. Now, when we're talking about a colony, what, what does that practically mean? 
Uh, first and foremost, colonists uh, were given land. Uh, the land around the settlement was surveyed. Um, allotments were granted to colonists. And if you didn't have Roman citizenship, uh, you would get Roman citizenship. Most Roman colonies were self-governing. They had their own laws, their own administration, and uh, they had certain legal and political rights. You could marry other Roman citizens, for example. In some cases, your land was treated as if it was Italian soil, um, which basically gave you some privileges um, in the context of taxation um, and things like that. So a colony had political and fiscal advantages, but there were also important social and cultural uh, advantages as well. Uh, first and foremost, in spite of the numbers I've just given you, uh, colonies were fairly rare. Um, and so sort of unique. Um, there was a prestige and a sort of specialness attached to the status um, of a colony. And it seems clear that colonies like to promote um, that specialness, that rare, uh, rareness, in, um, in the context of um, lobbying for political advantages and things like that. Um, colonial uh, cities could sort of boast a special connection to Rome. And I think importantly for our purposes, um, the elites that ran these cities could claim to be supported by Rome in a much more intensive manner than the um, elites and the administrators of other communities. So uh, elite status is probably um, a, an element of prestige and probably an advantage both for elites trying to maintain their power within the city um, and also when competing um, for prestige and power um, against other cities as well. Now, one of the ways that cities are promoting their colonial status is through uh, coinage. Um, these are civic coins, they're bronze for the most part, that each city is minting uh, for themselves. So circulation tends to be fairly local, although um, they can expand out into the hinterland and sometimes these coins can travel uh, quite far. But in any case, the, the perceived audience is, is local. Um, so the things that we typically see, the characteristics um, that colonial coins tend to share, first and foremost is the use of Latin legends. Um, either the initial use of Latin legends, that's often what we see in the colonial coins in the Western Mediterranean. Uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Greek titles, Greek legends, uh, tend to be replaced by, uh, by Latin ones. Second, we see the introduction of the colonial title, colonia, um, and a colonial or civic name. Um, the civic name tended to be um, connected to a dynastic name or to the leaders who played a role in the foundation um, of the colony. So Beirutus, the coin you see here, uh, its colonial name was actually Colonia Iulia Augusta, uh, Felix, with these references to Augustus, who was the person who gave the city uh, colonial status. And you can actually see uh, transformations in the relationship between a colony and various emperors through the transformation of the, the city's uh, civic name. So it's not static, it can change. We also see uh, changes in uh, local denominations, uh, weights and measures, the metrology um, of coins. Sometimes this seems to be an attempt to bring the local coinage in line with Roman denominations, make it more easily exchangeable. Um, there's some other elements here that we're not going to get into, um, but certainly it's not just an element of the design of the coins, but also sometimes uh, the weights and the measures of the actual use um, of the coins that can change. Audience is also an important um, aspect that is transformed um, when we see uh, the introduction of a colonial coinage. We have to consider the social and political position of the users, right? There's different vested interests in depicting the community as a colony or not. Um, for example, in places where not everybody is a colonist, um, the existence of and the promotion of this colonial uh, status reinforces a social and political hierarchy where colonists have different rights, different privileges, uh, different uh, rights to land um, than people who do not. It also can reinforce uh, political hierarchies within the city from an elite perspective. Elites have a different calculation um, when it comes to promoting colonial, uh, colonial uh, status on coins. Um, colonial status has the potential to legitimize or support uh, local officials and their decisions and to assert a special relationship um, with Rome, special power based on the city status as a colony um, and things like that. 
Finally, and the thing that we're going to focus on today is the introduction of new types um, and new iconographic themes. Um, this imagery is often but not exclusively connected to the Roman state or the political uh, and ritual uh, like organization um, or status of the city. I'm going to sh show you a few examples here. Um, this group of new, new types and new images um, is a, a sort of big chunk, um, a, a range of images that we see. I'll give you some common examples here. Aeneas, the ancestor of Rome, or the Romans. Uh, Roma, uh, the personification of Rome. Also Romulus and Remus, and the she-wolf. We could add to this um, depictions of typically Roman gods, depictions of the rituals, um, processes of civic foundations, um, imagery associated with the Roman military, all of these things. That this imagery shows up on colonial coins has been known for a long time um, in the 17th century. Uh, the French numismatist uh, Jean-Paul Vaillant is already discussing this, um, so we've known about this for a long time. Uh, this imagery is often called colonial imagery, um, but I myself prefer the term um, that's used by uh, Constantina Katsari and Stephen Mitchell. And in a 2008 article, uh, they talk about this, this group of imagery as state imagery. Um, and I like that term better because while this imagery is popular in colonies, they're not exclusive to colonies. So all of the designs you see here, for example, are widely found on coins of cities that were not colonies um, as well. There are really actually only a very small handful of motifs that appear exclusively in colonies. And the image that you see here is one of them. And that's what we're gonna focus on uh, for the rest of this talk. Uh, what this is, is a depiction of a civic foundation ritual. Um, it's a Roman ritual, and it was connected to the foundation of the city of Rome itself. Uh, according to our Roman writers, Romulus performed this act um, upon the foundation of the city of Rome. So it's closely connected to uh, the origin of the city and then thus uh, the origin of the empire. That ritual, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, was then picked up and it seems to have actually been used for other uh, city foundations um, in emulation of Romulus uh, at Rome. So um, the ritual is called the sulcus primigenius, uh, which means something like the, the first or the original furrow. And what it involves is marking the sacred boundary of the community with a plow. Uh, we have many ancient authors who describe the, the, the ritual and the process, including um, Varro describes it, Cato describes it, um, Servius, a few others. And what they tell us is that the ritual involves, um, you have to find an auspicious day for the foundation of the, uh, the city. You take a cow and a bull and you yoke them together to a plow. The plow is then controlled by a city founder. And you can see this figure uh, on the screen here. You can see him here. Uh, that figure uh, is the person who is founding the city either under the person under whose auspices the city is being founded or the person physically carrying out uh, the foundation. Um, and this guy is wearing a toga. His head is covered as typical sort of in a Roman ritual. And because if you've ever encountered a toga before, you might know that they're quite cumbersome. Um, what they would do is they draw the bottom up and sort of secure the toga around the torso um, to prevent entanglement. So the, the, the founder can kind of move around. And then this is what the founder would do. The founder would go with the uh, cow and the bull and they would um, circumscribe uh, the sort of sacred boundary of the, of the city. Um, our evidence suggests that the ritual is used at both newly founded colonies and also at places that were already settled. So for example, we have epigraphic evidence from Capua uh, in Southern Italy, which had already been inhabited by the time it became a Roman colony. We have inscriptions that say, um, this is the line where the plow uh, was run. So you could use it at both new colonies and at already founded colonies. And this is at what probably what this funerary ritual or funerary monument is showing us. You have the foundation happening outside the, um, the walls of an already um, built uh, city. So uh, the motif appears again and again and again and again. <laughs> over and over and over again um, on coins of Roman colonies. It's actually often one of the first numismatic types uh, used on a colony's coins. Um, and it's true that it is a very clear and distinct depiction of a Roman ritual. So it makes sense to call it a colonial or a state type. Um, 
But this particular motif is often brought up as an example of a Roman type or a colonial type in opposition to types that are local. Um, and what I want to do, what my research is looking at, is how these sort of typical Roman or colonial or state types um, are, don't always stand in opposition to local types. So basically, I want to look at examples where this kind of dichotomy falls short. I want to look at times when the motif is adopted and then adapted to make it more local, all right? Um, in other words, I want to find the local uh, in the colonial. So, um, in broad terms, I want to look at a few sort of examples of how the local and colonial meet here. Um, but in broad terms, we see about 42 different cities that mint uh, coins with this image on it between the first century BCE, third century CE. There are some geographic and chronological patterns. Um, so for example, the motif is more likely to be modified, localized uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, cities in the Western Mediterranean tend to use the more standard motif. Um, modifications tend to be more elaborate the later you get uh, in the Roman Empire. Um, there's some various trends uh, like this. Um, what I just called sort of the, the standard or the core motif is quite popular in most of these cities. In fact, a lot of cities will use this uh, image exclusively, um, while others mix and match. Um, so what I want to do is kind of look progressively at um, this standard, this, this motif, and how additional sort of local elements get layered onto it, getting more and more kind of elaborate as we go, and talk a little bit about the local circumstances um, that uh, are brought to bear in sort of the creation of those types, and also the reception, um, the way that audiences would interpret those types. So um, if we move away from that kind of standard core type, the most common way of localizing this foundation motif is by adding military standards to it. Um, lots of different military standards. Sometimes you have vexilla, sometimes you have um, legionary um, eagle standards. Um, these often seem to be a reference to the origin of the veteran colonists. Um, they've often been used, uh, the, the, the um, depiction of uh, standards on these coins are sometimes used as evidence for the um, city being a veteran colony rather than what we call a titular colony, a colony that received the title without a veteran settlement. Um, in certain cases, as uh, on the examples here at Aquatolomaeus and Sidon, both in Phoenicia, uh, those standards include the names of the units or the numbers of the units um, from which the colonists were drawn. Um, so you can see here um, on Aquatolomaeus's coin, there are three uh, standards there um, with the, the 10th and the uh, 12th legion, uh, for example. Uh, the standard from Sidon has a singular uh, legion. Um, but what we're seeing here is that the local element is celebrating the circumstances of the colonial settlement, all right? Um, it's taking a common approach, adding uh, military standards um, on the coin, and making it that much more local by putting the specific um, legion or the specific unit um, that the veterans were from on it. Um, one of my favorite ways of, of localizing these coins um, is sort of a regional practice. And I should note that a lot of times people will look at these coins and they will say, well, wait a minute, you told me that the, the right involved a cow and a bull and all of these, um, these animals look like bulls. Um, and you're right, I've spent a lot of time looking for udders on uh, provincial coinage and they don't seem to exist. Um, so despite our literary accounts specifying the use of a cow and a bull, there doesn't seem to be an attempt to differentiate cows and bulls uh, on provincial coins, but there are some attempts on coins of Asia Minor and Levant to use the local livestock. So what you see here are coins from Nineveh, Kremna, and Lystra, all in the same uh, sort of area, modern day sort of Turkey and Syria. Uh, and these oxen are actually humpbacked cattle, um, or what we call zebu, um, that are used in lieu of the, the sort of more straight-backed uh, oxen that we find elsewhere. The way, or the reason that you know that these are uh, humpbacked cattle is they have this really pronounced hump on their shoulders, and there's a lot of extra loose skin around the neck. So these seem to be depictions of what the local livestock would have actually looked like. 
Um, in his study of the colony, colonial coins of Asia Minor, um, Axel Filgis in 2015, suggested that what we have here is a process of design. It's a byproduct of the design process, that the die cutters were familiar with these animals. And so that's the ones that they used. Um, and I like that, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I wanna point out that even if it's not a deliberate um, way of making this motif local, it still ends up reflecting the lived experience of the people of the region. And, you know, actually makes it a more plausible depiction of the ritual um, people would have expected if the ritual was, ritual was performed for it to look like this, using these animals. And if they're remembering the ritual, this is what they would have expected. Uh, now, a few other uh, examples in a little bit greater depth. Um, this one comes from Neapolis, which is a city in Roman Judea. And we have a very different approach uh, on this coin. This particular city was um, a fairly large and prominent city before it gained colonial status um, under Philip I, who's ruling uh, 244 to 249. And after it gains colonial status, the city issues a huge number um, of coins a whole bunch of new uh, imagery shows up um, on the coinage, a whole bunch of state imagery, including um, the Roman emperor, uh, traditional sort of Roman gods, um, and these founder types. Um, so the founder type that you see here um, depicts that kind of core motif. You have the founder um, and the yoked oxen. You've got colonial uh, titles in Latin um, surrounding these figures, and the uh, yellow um, arrow there is uh, pointing out a military standard, so um, perhaps a veteran settlement. But what makes this coin, I think, special um, is the depiction of uh, a mountain uh, topped with a temple that sort of hovers over the scene up at the top there. This is the local sacred mountain, Mount Gerizim. Um, and just like it does in this uh, coin type, the sacred mountain sort of physically looms in the backdrop um, of the city. Uh, Mount Gerizim had long been a sacred mountain, um, both to the Samaritans who lived in the area and also to members of sort of the Greco-Roman population. Um, there was a big temple to Zeus um, on top of the, um, of the, of the, the mountain, um, and it played an important sort of religious role um, in the community. We see Mount Gerizim actually receives its own um, sort of special status as a reverse um, on coin types beginning in the second century. And under Philip, uh, these colonial coins integrate Mount Gerizim again and again and again. It's always omnipresent. It's always there placed at the top of the type in the field, often as a kind of background um, of the scene. And you can see two examples here. Um, same thing, you get the peak, you get the, the temple. Now, we might be able to sort of identify this as a kind of mint mark. Um, which says, hey, this particular coin belongs to um, Neapolis. Um, and certainly for people who couldn't understand Latin, um, this helps as a way to connect this, the, the city directly to that coin. Um, but I don't think it's quite as simple as that. Um, I think it's a little bit more um, involved. Um, with the mountain sort of standing behind the scene, the design seems to sort of uh, reimagine, remember um, a landscape. Um, where the Sulcus Primogenius ritual would have actually taken place. So it not only depicts the ritual, but it encourages the viewer to sort of see the design as a reflection of what, of what may have actually taken place. Um, it also links the temple and the mountain and the city's cults and its gods and its history to the establishment of the new colony. So it basically stitches together the new administrative state, status of the city um, to its previous religious identity. The two things are sort of framing uh, each other. We get a similar aspect evident on coins of Bostra, um, which is a city in Roman Arabia. Um, that becomes a colony under Severus Alexander, so in the third century, around 222 uh, CE. And here you can see similar elements, plowing founder, oxen, Latin uh, colonial titles. But in this case, what we're looking at is a built object in the field above, so above the back of the oxen. Um, and this is a, a motab, which is like a, a sacred altar or a platform, which is topped with sacred objects. Um, this motab is probably connected to the city's main god. Um, he's an Arabian god named Dusares. And the motab itself appears on reverse types of Basra 
um, before this period. But unlike at Neapolis, the motob doesn't show up on any other types. It doesn't show up on any other sort of state imagery or colonial types of Basra, um, only on this one. So what does this sort of tell us? Well, once again, we see that the Roman foundation ritual is being linked to this important civic cult. Um, and in a sense, the Roman colonial identity complements rather than overrides that sort of pre-existing civic identity. Um, it's sort of bringing these two pieces together um, and sort of showing how the two complement um, one another. Um, another example, we move now to um, Malus in the Roman province of Cilicia. So this is right in the area where uh, sort of Asia Minor meets Syria. Um, this is perhaps my favorite example. It's such a rich uh, coin. Um, it's such a uh, interesting coin um, that really gives you a sense of all of the different ways that this imagery can be adapted to convey kind of a local sense of what colonial status means. So Malice is another city that existed before it gained colonial status. Um, just like Basra, um, it becomes a colony under Severus Alexander. Um, and it seems to have gained colonial status um, during a period where the emperor is planning for campaigns against the Persians in the East. Um, so it's been suggested that maybe Malice was used as a staging ground for supplies and for troops. Um, in some way, it seems to be connected uh, to those campaigns. Um, however, it gains colonial status. Uh, the city does indeed col gain colonial status and it commemorates that status on its coins in a number of different ways, um, including with this uh, really wonderful, very rich uh, design. So what we see here um, is the city's new colonial titles, Malo um, on the left there, that's the city's name uh, before it became a colony. Um, and then Colonia, uh, Alexandria, uh, Felix, Felix means lucky. Um, and it makes a lot of sense that if you are a city uh, connected to um, a, a military campaign that you would want to be connected to the notion of, of being lucky. So there's the city's new colonial titles. Then what we see in the center of the coin is the emperor himself. He's dressed in military garb, which makes sense if we're in a, uh, a sort of um, warlike atmosphere. And he's facing the city goddess, who's sort of the representation of the city's fortune, its longevity. Um, she often wears a crown made of the walls of the city, representing her protection of it. In this case, she's holding a cornucopia, which is like a symbol of abundance. Okay, so it's a very sort of rich design. And what the emperor is doing is not just facing her, but he's handing her a small statuette. It's a little bit hard to see here, but what the statuette is, it's a small figure of a Greek satyr. He's holding a full wineskin over one sh shoulder, and he's raising his right hand. His head is up um, a bit. This figure, this motif, can be identified with the satyr Marcius um, in a particular composition called the Forum Marcius, which is named after a statue of the satyr, which appropriately stood on uh, the Forum in Rome. We don't have that statue preserved, um, but we do have depictions of it in various other media. So you can see the statue is preserved um, or is depicted um, on this relief from the second century in Rome. Um, Marcius himself is not well preserved, but you can see him standing there under a tree on a base with a wine bag in one hand. A better image uh, comes from a Roman denarius from 82 BCE, same thing. He's a satyr, you can see his little satyr tail there, wine bag over one shoulder, um, hand uh, upraised. So why do we have this image um, of the satyr? What does the satyr mean? Um, it's, it's highly debated. <laughs> Um, and we can talk more about this in the question and answer if you have questions about it. Um, but at some point in time, this statue or a motif derived from it becomes an incredibly popular motif in the provinces, sort of in its own right. We know that Roman authors say that statues um, of this type get put up in Roman fora around the provinces. Um, and indeed, at least 30 different cities um, mint coins depicting the satyr on them. Um, during the same period, first century to third century. So what does the satyr mean? Um, it's been suggested that the satyr represents uh, libertas, some kind of, oops, sorry, <laughs> some kind of uh, political freedom. Others have suggest, uh, suggested that he represents some kind of political or fiscal privileges. Um, 
Either way, he appears in close connection with uh, Roman colonies. Um, largely when we see um, Marcius, we see him on a coin of a colony. So whatever status he represented, um, or privileges or freedom, it was a privilege that was often coupled uh, with colonial status. We see that again and again and again. Uh, Marcius appears on the reverse of colonial coins uh, widely himself, as I've said, sometimes alone, sometimes in coordination with local deities. Um, the city goddess um, is a very popular uh, goddess for him to be paired with. You see an example there at Tyre. Um, sometimes as a Damascus there, he's paired with uh, civic symbols and things like that. Um, so all of this to say that um, Marcius is playing a small role in that coin of malice, but we also see this process of localizing state imagery happening in other types of types and other types of reverses um, as well. So let's go back to uh, that coin from malice. You can see here, emperor is handing that statue of Marcius, a representation of some kind of physical, fiscal or um, political privilege to the goddess. Um, that act of handing it uh, sort of seems symbolic of some kind of imperial largesse or privileges kind of bound up um, with the civic status. And these figures are accompanied by two more figures. Um, to the right, we have a figure who is heroically nude, who's physically crowning uh, the emperor. And this is Amphilochus, who is the Greek mythological founder of the city. He shows up on other coins of malice, um, same iconography labeled by name. Um, and below Amphilochus um, are a pair of yoked oxen, all right? They're a little bit small, <laughs> um, but still part of that foundation imagery, um, that Sulcus Permagenius ritual imagery um, that we've seen before. I give you here a detail also from a later coin, um, similar type from Malus um, under Trajan Decius, and you can see a little bit better the fact that the emperor is holding the uh, plow. So even though it looks like the, the oxen in this example are sort of standing next to him, the emperor is still holding the plow. We still have a, a twist on that foundation imagery. But the twist is sort of larger than just the existence um, of the um, smaller oxen and compared to the rest of the images of the scene. First of all, the emperor is not in a toga. The oxen are small. And um, the Roman kind of colonial aspect, the foundation aspect, is a much smaller part of sort of the overall effect. So what we have is a combination of elements that contextualize the new uh, colonial status sort of within the priorities and traditions of the pre-Roman community. So we have the pre-Roman founder who sort of validates and approves the new political status of the community, that's in Philicus. Uh, the colonial status of the community is depicted as being derived from the emperor himself. And that special relationship between emperor and um, city, the city of Rome, um, and city is reflected in the interaction between the emperor and the city goddess. So the colonial foundation ritual is bound up in this larger scene that is all about how the colonial status augments or complements the city, how it forges a special relationship, in this case, directly with the emperor, not just with the city of Rome, but with the emperor himself, okay? It's an, a way of saying, look at the, look at the good things that happen, uh, right, when you uh, support uh, the Roman emperor in the administration. So I want to look at, oops, there's the oxen. I want to look at another um, example um, that even more intensely is focused on how a city's colonial identity is bound up in its relationship, its unique relationship with the Roman administration. And this particular example comes from Caesarea Moritima, um, which is a city on the coast of the Roman province of Judea. It's a very famous city. Um, even if you don't work on Roman coinage, you've probably heard about it. Um, it's a city that's founded by Herod as a port city for his kingdom. Um, later, it's going to be picked up by the Romans as the sort of seat of the Roman administration um, in the region. It houses members of the Roman uh, legion, the Roman administration, and plays an important uh, sort of um, logistical and administrative role in governing the province. So um, the city of Caesarea becomes a province in the aftermath of the first Jewish revolt. The first Jewish revolt begins in 66. It's wrapped up around 70, 73 uh, CE. And um, the general in charge of the initial Roman response, a guy named Vespasian, 
um, used Caesarea as a winter camp for his legions, an administrative center. Um, many sort of elements of the, the campaign against the Jewish rebels were um, launched from Caesarea. And um, Vespasian uses his success in this war to become emperor, right? Uh, he capitalizes on his success. He becomes declared emperor. He goes off to be emperor. And then his son Titus uh, continues on um, with the campaign. The city becomes a colony soon after the end of the war, around 71 um, CE. And the implication here is that although the city was already functioning as the sort of administrative head um, of the, of the, the sort of region, um, colonial status ends up sort of being a reward um, for the city's support um, and its, its sort of function uh, during that war. Now, Caesarea is unusual because the city uses four different foundation types. It uses a standard type and three additional other sort of local types. We're not gonna look at all of those. We're gonna look just at two um, that sort of give you a sense for how uh, this type is, is localized and, and for what purposes uh, here um, at Caesarea. So the first one appears in 81, maybe 82 um, CE, and we get our, um, you know, and I'm sorry for the, the, I truly apologize for the quality of this image. I'm realizing now that it's not great, um, but bear with me. Um, it didn't seem to be uh, quite so pixelated on my laptop. Um, in any case, uh, the elements of this particular coin, um, we see the typical combination of togit founder and uh, a yoke of oxen. The togit founder though is holding a palm branch. Um, we don't have any colonial titles on this coin, which is interesting, and I'm going to come back to in just a few minutes. Um, instead, what we have for our re reverse legend is a legend referring to um, the recently deified colonial founder of the city, Divus uh, Wesp at the top there, and at the bottom uh, we finish the name, Divus Wespasianus. So uh, Vespasian was the colonial founder of the city, um, and also he'd been recently deified, maybe just uh, the year before. Um, not only does this sort of celebrate, commemorate the founder of the city, but it perhaps also acts as a kind of label for the image. Um, perhaps we are meant to imagine that the figure doing the plowing is the emperor himself, all right? So even though Caesarea was founded while Vespasian was alive, it gets a little bit reinterpreted to sort of accentuate uh, the city's connection to Vespasian, who, by the way, now is Divus. He's been deified. Um, thus highlighting both the city's fame, its close connection to the imperial dynasty, but also the fame of, um, of its founder. Now, um, recall that Caesarea becomes a colony in the wake of the first Jewish revolt. It's a Roman administrative city. It's where the governor uh, lives. And recall that the city seemed to play a very large role um, in that revolt. This status, its role as an administrative capital, plays an outsized role in how the city understands and depicts its colonial status on coins. All colonies seem to be interested in promoting a special connection to Rome, but at Caesarea, the coinage makes that connection seem inextricable. So one of the things we wanna look at here is that presence of a palm branch. Now, in Roman art, a palm branch is a symbol of victory. Um, but it also becomes closely associated in the art of Vespasian and his dynasty with Roman victory during the first Jewish revolt. Palm trees are sort of an identifying feature in depictions of captured and defeated uh, Jewish rebels. And um, I show you here an example of the famous Judea Capta coins minted by the Flavians to sort of celebrate uh, the Flavian victory. And in the center there is, uh, is a palm tree. Now, it's important to note that some coins in this image, some Judea Capta coins are being minted in Caesarea for use in the province. So this imagery is not just coming from Rome to the province, but also it's being minted on coins in the province and circulating around there. So all of this to say that the mint is aware of this connection between palm trees um, and the revolt. Um, so I don't think this is a, um, an accident, I think this is purposeful. We're supposed to think of the, uh, of the revolt and of the Roman victory. And this is also why I think we have an omission of the colonial and civic titles. Um, 
what we're seeing here is um, a way of the palm branch sort of evoking Roman victory. It reminds the viewer of Caesarea's role in that victory. It's an administrative reward um, in that victory, but there's an, a little element of slippage um, here. It's not just talking about the establishment of um, Caesarea itself as a colony, but of the whole uh, province as sort of being refounded by the, um, the Flavian success uh, in, this particular, uh, in this particular war. Now, the special relationship between emperor and um, a sort of link between the city and the successes of the empire are also reflected later on on the city's uh, foundation types. I show you here a foundation type of Septimia Severus, who's ruling 193 to, um, what, 211. Um, this is another emperor who comes to power during the civil wars. And Septimia Severus in particular is notable for rewarding cities which supported him explicitly with civic privileges and status, okay? We have a number of other cities in the Near East, including Tyre and Heliopolis, that gain colonial status explicitly because they supported Septimius Severus during this, the civil wars. So he's giving out uh, colonial status and perhaps also fiscal political privileges and honors for being on the sort of quote unquote correct side uh, during the civil wars. Now, we don't know where Caesarea stood during this conflict, but the coins perhaps imply um, their support of Septimius Severus. In fact, a lot of uh, cities in the Near East supported Septimius Severus. So what we see here on uh, the Severan coins is um, the founder, a little bit off uh, the coin here, sorry about that, um, the founder and the oxen, but in this case, uh, accompanied by a flying victory, who's holding a wreath and is sort of headed for uh, the plower as if the uh, victory is going to, to crown uh, the Togit plower. We also have a new addition to the city's uh, colonial title. The city's colonial title before this point was Colonia Prima Flavia Augusta Caesarea. In some cases, it's rendered as Caesariensis. But we also have the addition of FC, which is an abbreviation for Felix, um, and probably Concordia or perhaps Constans. So Felix means lucky. Concordia means something like harmony. Um, Constans would be something like stability, all right? Um, it seems appropriate in the context of a period in which uh, the empire has just come out of a period of civil war <laughs> um, to make references to the harmony, the stability um, of something. So given Septimius Severus's reward of other cities, um, it has been suggested by some numismatists that Caesarea may have also received um, an honor. For, their, for supporting them. Um, and that we see in these new titles, Felix Concordia, um, a reflection of that support, that the city supported Septimius Severus, and then they were rewarded with some sort of thing that we can't see, um, except for this adoption of these new titles. So even if Caesarea Moritima didn't have a direct role um, in supporting Septimius Severus, the coin still reinforces how the city's colonial status is linked to the successes of the emperor, all right? If the emperor is uh, successful, is victorious, um, then so too will the city be. Um, this time it might be in the context of a civil war, could also be in the context of Septimia Severus's Eastern campaigns, all right? Caesarea Moritima's colonial status derives from and is supported by the continued success of the emperor. And it's also particularly predicated on its performance, its engagement um, in the Roman Empire as a Roman administrative center. So um, between these different examples that we've looked at, we've seen a number of different ways of adapting the Sulcus Primigenius motif to express what it means to be a colony that is particular to each city, all right? Colonial status is something to promote but it could also be framed by other sort of relevant local elements, things like local gods, local landscapes, and the realities of the situation sort of surrounding the colonial grant. It also importantly, from my perspective, constructs a local way of remembering and understanding the colonial grant. It's not just a reflection of, hey, we're a colony. It's also a reflection of all of the elements that sort of um, add together to make 
colonial Bostra, right, rather than just any generic uh, Roman colony. So while colonies have a vested interest in connecting themselves to Rome, right, it makes them seem unique, it makes them seem special, it reinforces the power of elites, it reinforces the prestige of the city. Um, those are not the only things that cities care about. Those are not the only things that bring prestige or identity to a community. Different communities are going to localize these images for different purposes, sometimes to promote um, or acknowledge a close relationship with Rome in order to stand apart from their neighbors um, or to acknowledge the unique foundation uh, circumstances of the city. Um, promotion of the original imperial founder like Vespasian um, might highlight the antiquity of the city's grants, for example, um, perhaps playing off of or sort of competing to, with other colonies, right? This colony just received colonial status. They think that's great but we've been a colony for um, hundreds of years. Um, we often see popular emperors, people like Augustus and Vespasian. Um, those colonial uh, settlements tend to promote um, their colonial status um, at great length. And what we see is that symbols of sort of local resonance get grafted to uh, imagery of colonial status, to things that um, are already sort of defining the community. Um, I'd also like to suggest that sort of the persistent use of the motif after that initial colonial grant um, is a way to sort of inculcate a sense of cultural memory of that moment. Um, we presume that we don't know that the ritual actually happened or some version of the ritual happened, um, but that it did it, it, it happened in a local way, right? It happened at that community, which is sort of remembered its, um, imagined to be sort of like Rome. So these local types remember the colonial foundation uh, ritual, but framed that remembrance in a way that um, sort of manipulated the ritual as a kind of amalgamation. Um, it's not a newly founded city. It's a, a city that has been founded and is uh, joining together with the things that already made the community excellent. So um, while the space, um, while the plowing ritual actually circumscribes the land, ritually demarcates the area, um, transforms the community politically and ritually, um, shifts kind of economic and cultural implications, all of that stuff, um, the localization of these uh, foundation types becomes an opportunity to assert local identity in the face of um, all of the great things that being a Roman colony gives you. Um, in a sense, it's a way to resist the erasure of what came before, to sort of demonstrate visually uh, the negotiation involved in creating this sort of new face um, of a Roman colony. Okay, that's all I've got. I am looking forward to your questions and comments. I would love to talk to you more about Marcius, if anybody has any questions about that. Um, and thank you so much for your attention and for your interest. Okay, so thank you very much, Robin, for this very interesting talk. And I have the first question from uh, Daniel Wolf, and then I'll open, of course, which is, uh, were any substantial size cities not colonies? Yeah, actually a lot of uh, fairly substantial cities do not become colonies either at all, um, or only really belatedly. Um, I'm thinking of a city like Antioch in Syria, um, very large city, very popular city, um, an important administrative city, doesn't become a colony until the second century. Um, we see cities like Gaza and Ashkelon on the southern coast of uh, Judea, those cities uh, do not become colonies. So simply being a large city and being important um, doesn't necessarily give you colonial status. Um, particularly in the third century after the Severans, colonial status seems to be used as a way of rewarding um, cities. They needn't be particularly important cities. They could just be a city that an emperor had a particular relationship with. And so the... Um, sense of what colonial status is can shift a little bit away from being, well, just a way to recognize either a veteran settlement or an important city and more to the emperor saying, you are special to me for various reasons. Um, 
we have uh, we have other two questions here so the first one is uh, uh, Roman provincial civic coinage in the East disappeared around 300 CE. Are there any theories as to why? Yeah, uh, the answer is yes, lots of theories. Um, one of the theories or one of the, the reasons has to be um, the introduction of new uh, coin standards coming out of the Imperial, um, from the Imperial Center. Um, it also seems to be the case though, that as we get into the third century, um, local um, mints are slowly sort of petering out. We do get mints that um, are minting into the, the reign of Aurelian and a little bit later, um, but it's already beginning to wind down by the time we get those um, larger, um, larger changes coming from uh, the Imperial Center. Um, there's also the case that that period is incredibly unstable. Um, access to raw material um, becomes more complicated. Um, all of these other elements um, are probably in play as well. Thank you. If anyone prefers to actually ask the question themselves, so I'm very happy to have uh, people because I see Rebecca or Larry um, mm -hmm. or Elizabeth, if you like to ask the question yourself, it's up to you, uh, or I can read it. To me, it's the same. I read it. Hey, or, hey. Okay. I'm happy, I'm happy to. Uh, th thank you for the lovely talk. It was. Um, I learned several things. Um, one thing I was wondering about is one series of foundation coinage you see is of Commodus, and I was just wondering if that's more of an outlier or how it fits into the framework. Because, I mean, obviously he was mad, thought he was himself Hercules, and claimed to be found in Rome and had the 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 plow and other type of coinage from Rome itself. That's a fantastic uh, example. And I had that in my PowerPoint <laughs> um, before I decided <laughs> I made it. Um, yeah, that's a great example. So we do see Sulcus Primogenius coins being minted at Rome. Um, they begin under, we've got some Republican examples, but Augustus has um, some Trajan. Um, Commodus has both sort of regular ones. And then also uh, these medallions where um, he's depicted or Hercules is depicted um, and called the new founder of, of Rome. Um, those Commodus examples are a little bit of an outlier in terms of the imperial manifestation um, of this motif. Um, obviously through the use of, of, of uh, Hercules himself, but it's interesting to me that Commodus mints two, there are two of these coins are minted, two of these types are minted under Commodus. The more regular one, Emperor, Toga, doing the whole thing, and then also the Commodus um, examples. So um, I think that there is an element of attempting to sort of um, localize or make unique this particular circumstance, this particular moment um, that uh, Commodus sort of seizes. He seems to want to make it different than what has come before. This is not just any old refoundation of Rome. This is a very special refoundation um, of Rome. So does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, Rebecca here who has another question. Was the use of landscape imagery common on the coins reverse? Um, okay, sorry, you want to ask yourself the question? Sorry, Rebecca. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, pretty much what's in the chat. Um, I guess so, yeah. Was it, um, was it common among colonial cities to use landscape imagery on reverse? And if it was um more widespread than some of the cities you mentioned um was it more common in eastern colonies rather than western colonies and why right um yes yeah, so you, you already answered my your, your own question um it is much more common in the east um particularly in um sort of asia minor the levant um we see a lot of landscapes in the second but increasingly in the third century both built landscapes and natural landscapes. Um, and not just on the coins of colonies, but on many provincial coins. Um, so we don't see that as much in the Western Mediterranean. We do see things like uh, gates and stuff like that, um, but certainly not to the same extent. I mean, and in part because the colonial coins of the Western Mediterranean are not 
persisting um, into the third century. They sort of peter out uh, in the first. Um, and so the, the answer or the question is, is why? Why do we see that difference? Um, there's a lot of different levels, I think, to, uh, to this answer. The first is sometimes landscapes are incredibly important for articulating um, the sheer location of the city in the world um, or the things that make it important. Um, for example, our harbor is very important, so we're going to put elements of the harbor there. Um, sometimes built landscapes are important because they um, relate to the main cult of the city um, or something like this. Um, in general, mints in the Near East experiment more with um, more complex, sorry, in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, experiment more, more with more complex uh, imagery than in the West. Um, this may be just a personal preference. It may be the practices of the die carvers. This may be a preference of the elites who are choosing the design. Um, there's a whole host of, of, of different reasons. Um, my suggestion is that we really see this in the third century um, writ large because in the third century, we're seeing a lot of cities really trying to assert what makes their city um, unique and important. And one of those things is landscapes. One of those things is built landscapes and natural landscapes. And so, um, there becomes a greater interest in doing that on a sort of wider scale. Okay, we have a lot of questions. I had also a question, but I don't think we'll have time. I mean, it's just too interesting here. So we have uh, uh, an observation from Elizabeth. I don't know if she wants to ask it uh, herself, otherwise I'll go. Uh, sure, if you don't mind. Um, thank you for a great presentation, Robin, and hi. Um, just an observation, I noticed that when you showed the coin that had the offering table in it, it, to me, it was a very interesting sort of mix of how coins depict podiums and congiarium reliefs and libertat libertatis, that, that word I can't say professionally, sorry, um, in the way that the, the, the ladder approaches the podium, but um, the podium itself with the block work looks actually more like podiums in uh, state reliefs or monumental reliefs. Uh, so I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts about sort of the inspiration for these designs, like where they're sort of drawing on to get this sort of imagery. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I had not made that connection myself, so thank you for that. Um, this seems to be, so you're talking about the Motab um, from the Basra coin, right? Yes, you can't see me nodding, but yes. Okay. Um, so that seems to be um, a reflection of, of just the way these Motabs were built. I'm trying to think off the top of my head if we have any preserved, and I don't think so. We do have depictions on coins. Um, but um, so the stuff on top of it are, um, are bales, these local um, sort of sacred um, objects. And my sense is that they're basically designing them, I don't want to say realistically from life, you know what I'm saying, um, but I don't know that they're considering the larger um, artistic sort of context when they're designing it. Do you know what I'm saying? I think that they're saying, well, this is what a, a motab looks like. This is how I'm going to depict it. Um, maybe bringing in some of the design conventions that the die cutters are already familiar with. So they say, well, I need to make this look a certain way so that people who are at the city can recognize it. Um, I know how to make a ladder because I've made a ladder in these other contexts, so I'm going to use that. Does that make sort of sense? Uh, it does. Um, and actually sort of in this vein, uh, we were, you were talking about the use of landscapes in the background. Uh, as far as I know, and I could be just forgetting something, um, uh, Imperial Roman mints do not depict landscape elements more than like a tree, um, but they do in introduce the concept of depictions of buildings. So it's interesting that the provinces are sort of working off of that in something that cannot be mistaken for another building anywhere else. Absolutely. Now they do use some generic um, uh, imagery, um, but yeah, they're really, really interested in a way that in these types of landscapes and built landscapes in a way that imperial coinages are not, um, which I've always thought was very interesting. Thank you. 
Thanks. So we have three minutes. So we have one last question. So did they all choose uh, funders plowing just because it was, this was Curtis question. Did they all uh, choose funders plowing just because it was the conventional practice or did a central authority suggest the reverse types? Oh, Curtis. Um, I've got two minutes and I'm gonna to try to give you the, the short answer. No, 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 you can stay even longer. I mean, uh, that, don't worry. It's just actually for you to okay. not keep you for another half an hour here. Well, I'll, give, I'll still give you the, the succinct answer. Um, we don't really know. Um, it does seem to be the case that um, Mints, particularly in the West, um, let's see, Simon Jelinek, who is at Warsaw, um, wrote a really fascinating um, series of articles on colonial coins. And he has suggested, and I'm trying to think if this was just in a conversation or he's published it. Um, he suggested that um, some of the coins, the colonial coins in the Western um, provinces are working off of um, imper or Republican uh, coins as inspiration. So they're taking Republican designs and they're um, manifesting them locally. Um, in that case, they would have had to have access to those coins. Not clear if they just decided, well, we're going to pick this up and do it, or whether someone said, hey, the, you know, we do this, and so you should do it as well. Um, so it is possible that a central authority suggested um, the type or said this would be appropriate imagery. Um, certainly, we know that some cities, not all, <laughs> ask for permission uh, to mint uh, coins, and it might be that they ask for permission, and the Roman administration says, sure, here are some strongly suggested um, images that we want you to put on there. So that's a possibility. Um, the other possibility that we could kick around is that if you are gonna say being a Roman colony is an important status, some status symbol, what elements are you gonna put on the coin? And it's really this moment that the city becomes a colony. It is a Roman foundation ritual. It puts the founder in the very, you know, um, unique perspective of being sort of like Romulus. Um, so there's a lot of sort of thematic elements that make sense for a city to want to choose that on its own. Um, I think probably no one's gonna like this answer, but I think there's probably a little bit of both. Yeah. Also a little bit of by the time you get to the second and third centuries, there's just a sense of here's what types we see on colonial coins, that city is a colony, here's what they put on their coins, here's what we're gonna put on our coins. Um, it's also true, my last point here, is that not every colony uses these imagery, images. Um, some colonies really like to promote um, their colonial status with images like this and the Marcius. Some don't. Um, Corinth, for example, doesn't, doesn't use this, uh, this uh, type. Uh, Philippopolis, um, which becomes a colony under Philip, perhaps unsurprisingly, also doesn't use this type. They've got other ways of um, demonstrating their connection and their, their colonial status. So hopefully that answers your, your question. Cool. Thanks. So um, I have another question, but this will throw up out of time. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, write you uh, the question, my question for you, because now we are ready uh, to. So really, thank you. This was most interesting, as you see, even for from the number really of uh, questions you got. So really, thank you very much for, for this. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, really. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you taking the time. Bye -bye. Thank you, bye-bye.